Please explain the difference between central planning in our system as opposed to a communist system. My answer would be that the difference is the use of human labor, if you can call it decision-making labor. Human thinking is not required. Decision-making would actually be calculated based on the comprehensive database information about where resources would best be allocated. Yes, that's correct. But again, I guess uh, if you could explain to me, and I don't know if, if, if you guys have the, the, this thought all the way through, but I'm interested in, because the philosophy sounds wonderful, um, it does sound uh, some utopian. I hate to use the word. I you hate know. that word. It does sound it utopian. It is not utopian. I know. We get the same thing with my libertarian yeah. utopia, my free yeah. society. Because nothing's perfect. You're constantly trying to make things better, mm -hmm. more efficient, improve. Things are going to break. Yes, that's going to happen. Mm. The challenge is using that mental brain power to fix it. And I want to start by <clears throat> bringing to your attention a very important article, probably the most important economics article written in the 20th century. And that's the article by Ludwig von Mises, which appeared in 1920 in German. It uh, wasn't translated until uh, 1934 uh, in into English. And uh, it's called Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth. OK, so the second critique would bring in uh, Ludwig von Mises's uh uh, opposition to socialism. So he pointed out since the socialist state is the sole owner of all the means of production, since they own all these things, they can't be exchanged. Um, and I know that you alls system isn't necessarily Marxism, however there are some overlap. If one group of people owns everything, then there's, there's no market. Without exchange, then there can be no market prices. Uh, and that was his uh, argument against the impossibility, impractability of socialist economic calculation. Uh, without market prices, how can the state calculate the cost of production? And this once again brings us back to the calculation problem. in that when you have a medium of indirect exchange that you can place a monetary value on, which uh, comes to, you know, it brings, is brought to fruition through the price based on market and demand, supply and demand, which again goes back to the individual who is the most apt and capable of deciding what he uh, thinks would better his condition at that mm -hmm. time. Right. And I would argue not a uh, technocrat or a technician right. but not, or a central planner. So. Why don't we hear this, these, these ideas, uh, and even really just a, a, a deeper questioning of capitalism and the free market? It's, I mean, it's basically a third rail of, of politics. But even on most of our media, even people that uh, that a lot of the the country respects as kind of uh, thinking, you know, forward thinking people like Elon Musk. There will be fewer and fewer jobs that a robot cannot do better. Like we're lucky. This is a creative job. It's hard for machines to create, but for jobs that are single task jobs, a lot more of those are going to be technologically driven. What to do about mass unemployment? This is going to be a massive social challenge. Um, and I think ultimately we will have to have some kind of universal basic income. One thing that we're going to need is universal basic income. I don't think we're going to have a choice. So you might say, well, we have a guaranteed annual income for people, which I think is a horrible solution, by the way. We said we're going to have to figure out some way to feed all these people that are going to get taken out of the job market because their jobs have become irrelevant. So I think that universal basic income is for when the technology gets so good that there legitimately are no jobs. I don't think that we're there yet. And, uh, and let's say Neil deGrasse Tyson and the innovations and creativity in science, engineering, technology, and math will be the drivers of tomorrow's economy. Jobs, 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 jobs. Jobs. The problem is, is that we're hyperproductive, but the spoils go to those at the top, and some of those resources need to be funneled down to the people who have zero so that they have an opportunity to at least get to the point where they can innovate, and so the bloody whole bloody thing doesn't wobble and fall. That's the word in four letters, jobs. And if you are not a participant on that frontier, you will trail behind it and possibly get left behind entirely. Most of These people that can look at the numbers the same way you can, why don't you hear it? It's bias. <laughs> well, it's that? bias. Yeah. It's, it, there's an overriding bias of people born, especially if they've been rewarded. Financial stability of a nation is what needs to be established. That connection somehow is broken. So if there's scarcity in any industry, then there's going to be a need for, for labor. There's going to be need for new labor. People are going to still have to 
you know, work on these trucks and deal with technology. And the computer industry didn't destroy jobs all over the United States when typewriters went out. So I think it's a little premature. I'm not sure there will ever be a day when there's a machine that when the machine society is so well developed that it can take over all jobs. I do think you're seeing a bifurcation in the labor market. So. People don't see it. Why don't Americans see it, the connection? Dare I say that maybe we're not trained to think that way? It doesn't take you know, a degree in social science to see the operant conditioning of the wealthy that reach a point where they've been so rewarded that their brain's like, what, you're not going to counter this system? What are you doing? This is, this is your survival. We're trained to think if you do A, then there must be B, cause and effect. Do you think Americans understand that chain of events? No. Are they starting to? No. You should be educated. And in the education, you should value science, engineering, technology, and math. This is what has been rewarding you. So, and that's why the only thing that any of these guys have talked about is universal basic income. Universal basic U income. Universal basic income. I think it's going to be necessary. So it's mean that unemployed people will be paid across the globe. Yeah. Because there is no job, machine, robot is taking over. Th these are not uh, things that I think that I wish would happen. These are things, simply things that I think probably will happen. Because of they, they see the efficiency. Uh, they, meaning the whole of the high business community and government, understands what we're doing with technology, understands the efficiency, understands that all of this efficiency that's been generated over the past, past 50 years has gone to the 1%, with eight people with more money right. now than the bottom 50%. They know they have to do something if they want to preserve their hierarchy. It's an intuition they feel. If you do so, you get to innovate and invent new industries, new economies. If you invent new economies, everybody has jobs tomorrow. If my assessment is correct, and they probably will happen, then we need to say, what are we going to do about it? So universal basic income is the most logical step for them. But there's plenty more that needs to be done. And I, I stand with you in the sense of, of the disgust. Anyone that claims to be for science that hasn't taken the time to just look at their own world, forget about the cosmos for a second. Let's not terraform planets yet. Let's not send rockets. Let's worry about what the, what's yeah, happening yeah. here for a moment. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think it's just, just disappointing. That's a chain of events. It's not A equals B. You've got to go through three other variables to get to B. What about race? Do you ever touch race in your public commentary? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I stopped doing it in 1991. The loudest statement I can make is to not ever mention it again. That's, that's, and, and it's not a cop-out. It may sound like that. It's as long as I make it an issue, then people commenting about me will make it an issue. And when I hear you say... I don't want to talk about race. I want to. I just want to talk about science. And I, you're not choosing to comment on on these topics. Well, when people ask me, I'll comment. I, I just don't make it part of my platform. I don't say I'm coming to your city and I'm going to talk about race and sex and and injustice. And no, that's not what I do. It's just dis dis disappointing. I don't think these concepts are that foreign or that difficult to get people's head around. It's just the, it's the social indoctrination and fear and the fear of being ostracized and labeled as something that will be inconvenient for their reputation. So. Uh, it's not that I'm afraid to talk about it, or it's just that when I'm given the choice, I don't talk about it, because I have so much else to share. And I think some kind of a universal basic income is going to be necessary. It's the only socially acceptable, plausible thing to do besides charity. So without this means of determining the best way, and I think there might be a necessity in order to operate in an industrialized or an advanced civilization, in order to distribute or distribute or distribution. This can either be directly from the production facility, as in the case of an on-demand custom one-off production, or it can be sent to a distribution library for public act access in mass based on demand interest in that region. So you keep updating. Now, now the, output, the output of goods and services will be extremely high. Um, so with automation, um, they, will, they will come abundance. But, but, but then give them money. Right. Right. Like, they like don't that, want to right. hand out. Oh, you know, they but, want to work. This goes to the question of meaning and, yes. you know, how, yes. you know, like what are Absolutely. we going to do? Because we're, we're the precipice we're getting to is everyone, virtually everyone, is going to be in the position of these coal miners. Um, there will be, uh, almost everything will get very cheap. We'll just end up doing a uh, universal basic income. It's going to be necessary. The, the, the harder challenge, much harder challenge, is how do people then have meaning? And that, this, that's a good thing. That's the thing. I mean, that's, a, that, that's the, you know, why can't they figure out that they just want to learn new languages and, and spend more time with their kids and play Frisbee and, and uh, have fun? So if you have a machine that can make everything basically for free, 
and then there's a bunch of people who you don't need anymore to do work, then you can talk about a universal basic income because there's no scarcity. Scarcity right. is what creates a need for labor. Like a lot of people, they derive their meaning from their employment. We need a new ethic that and politics that decouples a person's claim on existence from doing profitable work that someone will pay you for. As if you're not needed, if there's not a need for your labor, how do you, what's the meaning? Do you, do you have meaning? Do you feel useless? These are much, that's a much harder problem to deal with. Because a lot of that work is going away. Hey, I, uh, the library system is where goods can be, be obtained. Some goods can be conducive to low demand, customer production, and some will not be. Uh, food is the easy example of a mass production necessity while a personally tailored piece of furniture would come directly from the manufacturing facility once created. And I suspect, again, this on-demand process, uh, which will likely become equally as utilized as mass production, uh, will be an enormous advantage. Uh, as noted, on-demand production is more efficient since the resources are going to be utilized for the exact use demand as opposed to the block things that we do today. I do not want a bag that is more expensive than the cash I have to put in it. Distribution library. Inventory is assessed in a dynamic direct feedback link, of course, between production, distribution, and demand. If that doesn't make sense to you, again, all you have to think about is how inventory accounting and tracking works at any major commercial distribution center today with, of course, a few adjustments made in this model. We're already doing this type of stuff already. If that doesn't make sense to you, again, all you have to think about is how inventory accounting and tracking works at any major commercial distribution center today, with, of course, a few adjustments made in this model. We're already doing this type of stuff already. And regardless of where the good is classified to go, whether it's custom or not, libraries or to the direct user, this is still an access system. In other words, at any time, the user of the custom good can return the item for reprocessing, just as a person who obtains something from the library, library can as well. Now, with those good deals and day after Christmas sales, gift returns can be a hassle for some retailers, especially if the item being returned was stolen. And according to the National Retail Federation, more than 5% of returns this holiday season will be fraudulent. According to the National Retail Federation 2014 Return Fraud Survey, retailers estimate $3.8 billion will be lost for return fraud this holiday season alone. Fraudulent return is a something that either was not purchased here and uh, the customer actually would like to return it here, um, or someone taking an item from another customer or another person and also trying to return it here, even though it was purchased here. According to the survey, more than 90% of retailers say they have experienced the return of stolen merchandise in the last year. As more shoppers look to digital receipts, for ease and convenience, retailers are noticing increased return fraud instances with return receipts. Or in order to send signals to the producers, to the technicians, to the automated factories that are producing things. Production efficiency. In short, this is the digital filter that moves design to one of two production facility types. One for high demand or mass goods, and one for low demand or custom goods. The first uses fixed automation, meaning unvaried production ideal for high demand. And the second, flexible automation, which can do a variety of things, but usually in shorter runs. This is a distinction that's commonly made in traditional manufacturing terms. All products are allocated based on the prior demand class determination, as noted before. So low consumer demand products follow a direct distribution process. It would be difficult in order to most effectively and efficiently manage the distribution of resources, goods, or services without a uh, medium of uh, communicating how much particular good or service is in demand at the time. High consumer demands follow the mass distribution process, which would likely be the libraries in that case. Both, of course, low consumer demand and high, high consumer demand products will be regionally allocated per the proximity strategy. How can it know in producing one thing whether it's using resources that are more valuable used elsewhere. Basically the question in regard to central plan our system versus the communist system, the points you make are actually are quite accurate. I would say you, you, know, you can call it a planned economy. This has a bad ring to it due to what has happened historically. So absent that price system, I feel... It can't know that, okay, because it, it can't, doesn't have any prices.
potentially, if you even if you think that there's these altruistic uh, technicians that would be able to centrally plan that thing with the use of massive supercomputers, I think it would end up just as the Soviet Union ended up, as Mises predicted, you know, more than 50 years earlier. Due to the rise of, of people that become dictators, and it's not based on really the welfare of society whatsoever, it's based on a larger order stratification. And a collapse, famine, the inability to fulfill that inherent demand in the individual. Mises concluded in the absence of economic calculation of profit and loss, socialist planners cannot know the most valuable uses of scarce resources, and therefore a socialist economy is strictly impossible. Economy in the sense of Menger's economizing. When it comes to economics, which in Greek means management of a household, it also implies efficiency to economize. You know. mm -hmm. This is a natural order type of system that is natural to the, to the earth, to the environment that we inhabit. Something science stumbled upon, you know, you don't do certain things, you don't pollute the atmosphere with, by burning oil, it creates climate destabilization, you can stick with that example, and extend that on to infinity as far as how we are bound by natural order laws. Nothing metaphysical about that, nothing esoteric. Using resources for their most highly valued ends. That's not to say that central planners cannot set themselves up and produce something, okay? But the production will be chaotic. You know, our, abstractly speaking, a planned economy versus a market economy is, there's really no comparison as far as what would be more efficient in abstraction. It's and will not even serve the purposes of the planners. That was Mises' argument. It's simply getting the infrastructure, the technological infrastructure, together to, to do it. It's the only logical way as far as I can tell. Mm. The challenge is using that mental brain power to fix it mm. in a way that you're not cost restrictive. It's not like, oh, well, we can't solve that problem because it would cost a billion dollars. With all due respect, nobody has ever been richer than you are at this moment. I have no money to spare. What would it take? I mean, what would it take for you to feel secure? More. So what are the preconditions of economic calculation? Well, first of all, Mises says there has to be private property in all stages of production, including land, mines, factories, and so on. They have to be privately owned so that they can be exchanged. Um, and they also have to be permitted to be exchanged. So there has to be private property, there has to be free exchange, and there has to be sound money, money whose value doesn't fluctuate wildly, as, for example, during a hyperinflation. Basically, money that, uh, who, who, th whose value is not influenced or determined by the political authorities. So those are the three preconditions. And guess what? Socialism abolishes all of those conditions. There is no private property in the means of production. There is no freedom to exchange. And finally, money is not used. There, there might, workers are paid rubles, but the rubles that they're paid are really vouchers to buy consumer goods. Okay, there are no commodities markets, stock markets, people trading businesses and so on. Money is not used for that purpose. So it's not really money. Not really money. Your true wealth is your time and freedom. Currency is a medium of exchange, a unit of account. It is portable, durable, divisible, and something called fungible. Fungible means that each unit is the same as the next unit. A dollar in my pocket buys the same amount as a dollar in your pocket. It's just vouchers to go to the, the company store, in this case a socialist company store, and buy the things that they may produce. Money is all of those things plus a store of value over a long period of time. Uh, and then we came up with a medium which naturally arises because it's the most practical. Even financial planners, bankers, your accountant, they don't understand the difference between currency and money. The currency in your pocket is a medium of exchange. It's a unit of account because it's got numbers on it. It's somewhat durable, it's portable, it's divisible in that you can make change, and it's fungible. A dollar in my pocket buys the same amount as a dollar in your pocket. It's tradable, and this is what uh, Murray <coughs> Rothbard and the Austrians refer to as direct ex indirect exchange. But because governments can print more and more and more of it and dilute the currency supply, it's continually transferring wealth out of your pocket, out of your bank account, to the government and to the banking system. Direct exchange right. would be tomato right. for lawnmower. And that's why you have the money by proxy to cover those indir indirect. Yes. And another, so 
Are you against the uh, use of indirect mediums like shells early on or cigarettes in prison? Not that we would Right, right. No, lists. no, I think they were all relevant at the time. So since socialism abolishes all of these three, three preconditions, it nullifies economic calculation and therefore it destroys the social division of labor, the interaction of people and specialization of people that brings up that that is directed by monetary calculation. Last passengers, sorry, the Mocha Cappuccino Extreme is reserved for. I want the Mocha Cappuccino Extreme. Bill, my room, please. Food can be purchased in the ships. Sorry, the French roast. Sorry, the pumpkin sp spice. Sorry, vanilla chai. Mm. In the resource-based economy, it's the only no is we can't solve that problem because we haven't invented a, a way to do it yet. Mm -hmm. and there's no monetary drawback. Mm -hmm. But you're looking at, you know, where are you going to get the people to start this ball rolling, mm -hmm. right? They are The means. Well, yeah, we're already out there. Me. Mm -hmm. There are others like me. There are those of us in the Zeitgeist movement. We are the ones, the, the, the Jacques Frescos, the Yous, who are mm -hmm. not exactly on board with TVP and the, and the RB, I understand. But we do share a lot in common. And I think that a lot of people just don't understand what the calculation problem is. He focused not on, on the fact that the planners might not have enough knowledge. It seems that their interpretation of the argument is that there's all this complex information in the economy and it's just too complex for any one single entity to comprehend it all. In the common tongue, it says one ring to rule them all. Because they could always hire or impress into service scientists, engineers, um, and, and various other technical people. Okay. There's no, what he later called, intellectual division of labor. Everyone in society participates in creating, and, and this is created, the, the, the price system. Okay? Ideas, concepts, certain social um, expressions of interactions among people can be created. There are new things under the sun. The price system is something that does not exist before people interact. And it cannot be um, created by one person. One ring to find them. It has, it's a social uh, creation. One ring to bring them all, and in the darkness, find them. And, and that would apply if you're using humans to make decisions for other humans in your idea of central planning and whatnot. But what about when the individual who is making that personal choice has the ability to create on demand? As I mentioned earlier. What Mises pointed out was that the problem of socialism was the problem of one will acting. That is, one person determining how resources were going to be allocated. And if one person owned all those resources, there could not be prices. So now your means of production is not derived by somebody's assumption of what we think would be adequate. How many resources do we need to say we have a city of a million people? You know. So the essential mark of socialism is that one will alone acts. But what about when the individual who is making that personal choice has the ability to create on demand? It's immaterial whose will it it is. It could be somebody who's very benevolent, very smart. It doesn't matter. The main thing is that the employment of all factors of production is directed by one agency only. And, and that would apply if you're using humans to make decisions for other humans in your idea of central planning and whatnot. And then he says, you know, one alone chooses, directs, and so on. Um, and that is the problem. We can do, you can do a survey. Let, let's kind of put ourselves in a world for a moment, a hypothesis. Every home that everybody lives in has a computer system that is runs through the integrated, you know, of the city. There's a city brain, I guess you could say. And while it is indeed true that the information in the economy is extremely complex, that is not the argument. If it were the argument, then the solution would be really simple. Just have a smarter computer that is capable of, of comprehending all this complex information. So how can we calculate the cost of producing the car under socialism, okay? In the market economy, everything that's needed to produce any good has a price at every moment. So no matter what you want to produce, you can look at the price structure. Moving on to the industrial complex, the layout. This means the network of facilities which are directly connected to the design and database system I've just described. Servers, production, distribution, recycling is basically it. Also, we need to relate the current state of resources as per the global resource management network. It doesn't control people, all it does, it's an information gathering system. You want a railroad from city A to city B, but between the cities is a mountain range. Suppose somehow you know that the railroad, once built, will serve the nation equally well whether it goes through the mountains or around. If you build through the mountains, you'll use much less steel for the tracks because that route is shorter. So they never know whether they're producing things that 
have more value than other things that could have been produced, or whether they're just wasting resources. But you'll use a great deal of engineering to design the trestles and tunnels needed to cross the rough terrain. That matters because engineering is also needed to design irrigation systems, mines, harbor installations, and other structures. And you don't want to tie up engineering on your railroad if it would be more valuable designing those other structures instead. That's a massive amount of knowledge held by millions of people throughout society. How might you get it? You might try surveys. And so a, a question, you know, Today we'd like you know we're going to do an annual survey. How many tomatoes do you eat in your household? You know, different you know, kind of like a census, but a census of stuff. You know, how much stuff do you really need? So that then the system can say, okay, this is how many resources we need based on the demand of the individuals. So you as a person are saying, I have a chair. I don't need a chair next year. I might need a replacement because it's kind of starting to fall apart. And you can break things down that way. You don't need to do it all at once. But every once in a while, every couple of days, you're just asked a different question. And over the course of that year, that allows the system to know through algorithms, here's how many people we have. Here's how much stuff they need or don't need. Here's what they want or don't want. So now we can directly manage. This is how many resources would be required plus a percentage over, because there's always an overfill. You want to account for tolerances. We do that in engineering all the time, plus or minus a percentage. In this particular case, it would always be a plus so that you cover any visitors, out bases, anything like that. And so now we get to the point of if somebody wants something, it's a, it's a make on demand, and we know we have the resources available based on trend analysis. It, it was this much last year, it was this much the year before that, it's this much now. We can use proper mathematics. They do it in economics now with monetary stuff. There's no reason they can't do it with direct they don't do it successfully now, hence the current economic crisis. Yeah, though, let me say they did do it better. There really is no other way to account for the resources of the planet and use it in the most efficient way. And you know this, man? Than to have a planned economy. And I know that's a controversial thing, but there's really, if you, for example, had a factory and you had a bunch of machines that did certain jobs and you had a bunch of people and you had a bunch of other tools and you just tossed everything randomly to everybody else and gave them no instructions about how to work together as a holistic system, obviously you'd have chaos and that factory wouldn't work very well. Well, the planet is nothing more than a factory, and it's time we treat it holistically as such. When I think when money was a little more rooted in something real. If you gold. Go, you know. The reason that gold and silver are the optimum form of money is because of their properties. It's an easy medium of exchange because gold and silver store a large amount of value in a very small area. It's a unit of account. Pure gold has the same value all over the planet. So an ounce of gold buys the same amount here in Egypt as it would in China or in the United States. It's durable. The same gold that Egyptians were using in trade 5,000 years ago is still here with us today. It does not corrode. It's divisible. You can make change with it. It's very portable. You could use something like oil as money. It's just that you can't carry around a barrel of oil on your back. It's Fungible, pure gold is the same wherever it is on Earth. Pure silver is the same wherever it is on Earth. It's limited in quantity. That's the reason that it maintains its purchasing power. Governments cannot print it. Over the last 5,000 years, only gold and silver have maintained their purchasing power. There have been thousands upon thousands of fiat currencies, currencies that are unbacked by gold or silver, and they have all gone to zero. Yeah, gold or something like that, if you go back, you know, several centuries, the initial ideas followed a proper trend analysis line. And science and engineering does it all the time, and that, that's relatively accurate. Then you can still run your social system, you can do your resource allocation in a proper way, but instead of assuming what somebody is going to want or need, you ask them. To answer, you would need to determine which bundle of resources is less urgently needed for other purposes. Which route should you choose? for the good of the nation. To reason about where to route the railroad, you need this kind of information for all possible uses of engineering and steel. That's a massive amount of knowledge held by millions of people throughout society. How might you get it? You might try surveys. And now they have the technical capability in their own home to just, or via their phone or whatever, just say, Dude, yeah, no, I don't need that. Yeah, I'm gonna need that and that. But think how many people you would need to survey. 
All those who prepare meals with produce and all those who take delivery by truck for starters. The things that will never change is you always want a boatload of food, a boatload of energy. There are some things that you always want an abundance of. But when it comes to individual product creation, chairs, things like that, people like this model but don't like that model, that's where you get into print on demand or build on demand so that people can get exactly what they want. The numbers would be staggering. And often people don't even know what they prefer until they face an actual choice. So they might not be able to answer survey questions accurately. Hell, they could even design their own stuff. Mm -hmm. You can get somebody to say, well, I like that chair, but let me hop into my CAD program. I want it a little wider, a little taller. I don't like those legs, but I want those legs. Can you please make me that? You want to talk about the height of personal choice and personal freedom is to quite literally be able to customize whatever you want, send it to the system, and the factories will be like, OK, and spit it out. Even if they could, by the time the surveys were returned and processed, much of the information would be out of date. Except it contains all of the, all of the information digitally that is required to produce them. This is how demand is assessed. It's feedback and it's immediate. But that's not the argument. That's not the problem. And even if you could get complete and timely information about what everyone knows that's relevant to every use of steel and engineering, you would still need to deduce from it where to build the railroad. The problem is not the complexity of information. The problem is that without market prices, you no longer have the ability to calculate profit and loss. Mises said that the rational allocation of resources is impossible without economic calculation using market, real market prices. And Without that ability, you no longer have the necessary information that allows you to calculate how to allocate resources in the most efficient way. I think we are now beyond that time. Okay. That's the only difference is the Austrian form of economics thinks that money is absolutely necessary in a sense, as if we've always had it, when if you go back in time, no, we didn't. It was invented at some point, which means we did exist without it. Sure. And then we developed as, as a means to facilitate our growth as a species. Who's to say we haven't now gotten to a point where we don't need it again?